Guys, I'm pissed. Transportation is broken. It's broken in so many ways. When you depart, when you are traveling, it's broken. When you arrive, it's broken. So if you want me to demonstrate what I'm talking about, then probably I want to show you something that happened last week, OK? This is Chile. Um, last week, we were inside this uh, metro. And what happened is very simple. We were all inside there. The metro stopped. And we've been 15 minutes uh, doing a world championship of uh, sweating, <laughs> smelling each other. Nasty, OK? It happens. It happens all the time. And the way we conceive transportation is usually like that. We try to solve one problem, and we create uh, a lot of other problems. Um, for example, you know, in, in airports, if we um, think about what we do at the airport, we arrive there, and 70% of the things that we do there, we could have done it before. Why are they making us lose all this time? I don't know. Maybe someone hasn't thought, think about it, right? Imagine when you are waiting for your luggage. Everyone knows where you're going except your luggage. And then you discover that she's not there, or it, it's not there. When you're staring the, uh, <laughs> the carousel, waiting for a miracle to happen, right? It happens all the time. So traffic. If you think you have a bad situation in your country, then it means that you've never been in Jakarta. You've never been in China. You've never been in places where this has reached a level of you know, nastiness. Like, this is two months ago in China. Okay, China National Day, they've been in traffic for 24 hours. They are ninja traffic jammers. They know how to do these things, right? They really study how to create it. This is Beijing in a very good day. This is Beijing in a very bad day. <laughs> but if she is living in the other side of LA, I'm not going to date her. It's not going to happen. I'm sorry. It's not. We are choosing who to love based on traffic. <laughs> if I would tell you that today is the last day of your life, you will be hungry. You will be disappointed. You, you start to think about all the things that you have not been achieving, and all the people that you want to love, the, the places that you want to see. Well, if you live in one of these cities, you're living years less than was expected, OK? And they're not stealing your life all of a sudden. No, no, they're doing it 10 minutes there, half an hour there, one hour there. And we're becoming numb. We are just get the habit to it. We think this has to stop because it's influencing our life in a very deep way. And there is a solution. So what I said, it's probably not the most important thing. There's some other important thing to say. To understand the future, you have to look at the past. So um, in, at the um, end of the century, in 1870, there was a very brilliant entrepreneur called Eli Beach that worked at a project inside the New York subway. And it was an evacuated tube, uh, basically very similar to what we are doing. But there's been stopped for a series of reasons, lack of funding, but it was a genius guy. In 1904, Robert Goddard, the father of rocket science, patented a solution that was very similar to what we are doing. Um, humanity tried to do this, but you know, science was not always at the same side of imagination. Uh, that project was stopped because every scientist at that time said humanity cannot travel above 100 miles per hour. And it was demonstrated by uh, various uh, scientific publications. In 1969, the American government published four projects, and two of them were very similar to the Hyperloop, tube flight and gravity vacuum. So over and over, we have seen this appearing in every 
way uh, of uh, um, uh, media, right? Uh, you know, the, the Simpsons, the, the Jetsons. When Elon Musk published in 2013 a white paper showing a possibility that was already there, my business partner had a site called Jumpstart Found, and he thought it was a good idea to publish this white paper inside the, the website and trying to do it in a right, in a brand, brand new way. And this is where I am excited about, because we are not only creating a company, we are creating a movement. Um, usually, these kind of projects are created behind closed doors. But what we are doing is different. We started to ask people ideas. We call it CrowdStorm. And we asked, whatever you do, please contribute. Give us an opinion about what we are doing and make it better. And we ask all kinds of questions, like, you know, how do you do this? Or um, do we need a ticket? Not only do we need a paper ticket, do we actually need a ticket as a monetization system? And we've seen that probably no. So right now we have 520 scientists. They are moonlighting to create a better future for us. And they're all working in exchange of stock options. And guess what? Whoever say that you need money to do everything was wrong. Because now we have contribution for $60 million without raising a penny. They say we are the biggest uh, startup pre-seed of the planet. I think it's a different uh, version of the story. Is that is the first attempt the humanity has done to create a better future, just using passion as a fuel. But this is not the most important thing. I will tell you what is most important. So the Hyperloop, it's a very, very simple concept. I usually explain it in, in this way. You imagine to have a train, right? So the train, you put this train inside the tube. Then you suck out the air from the tube using a pump. And then using a magnetic levitation system, you find a way to, to levitate it. And because there's no resistance, you can move it at almost the speed of sound with no resistance. And this is cool, but look at this. The technical term to define an object that moves at the speed of sound is being badass. <laughs> now, we want to move at the speed of sound and faster, but this is not the point. The point is about moving people efficiently. We're using a combination of, of renewable energy. So we're using solar panel, we're using wind, kinetic energy, regenerative braking, and in some climates where the solar panels are not efficient, we use geothermal. The combination allows us to have 30% more energy than we consume. We're also building on pylon because we want to respect the land and we don't want to disrupt the land as the normal rail or highway. You know, when you build these things, you just create a giant barrier and animals cannot migrate. You, you really, it's very invasive and the value of land goes down. We're using new materials. We can reach 30,000 PSI of resistance. What does it mean? We can resist earthquake, very big earthquake. If an earthquake hit Los Angeles, I want to be in an helicopter or inside an hyperloop. So we are also looking around how can we improve when we build infrastructure in a way that we also are sustainable and we can create ecosystems around the pylons. We don't want to resolve all the problem of humanity, but this is very important. Scalability, how can we achieve something that can grow? Um, we can transport um, if an average of 28 people in a capsule, even if we build, we can build bigger, but um, we can transport 3,400 people a, an hour, 67,000 people a day, 24 million people a year. We can substitute the entire flight industry between Los Angeles and San Francisco four times with one tube. We can have seven tubes. If it's not disruptive, tell me what it is, okay? So we're using various ways uh, also to improve uh, how we conceive transportation. This, the most disruptive one is the way we levitate the capsule. Imagine we have three phases. The first is to accelerate the capsule. Uh, after 30 miles, 
uh, the way we build the old back arrays, the series of magnets that we created, allow us to basically levitate without using any energy. It's passive. So we, in that phase, the capsule leaves the wheels and actually levitates. And then we, with the uh, inductive motor, we can actually accelerate the capsule. In the same way, we can decelerate and even if the electricity goes down uh, from the um, electric motors, then we can land safely back uh, into the tube. So it's uh, kind of a rail with a little bit of airplane and maybe it's an hyperloop, right? The um, other innovation that we are looking to is about how is the passenger experience. When you are inside a capsule and you don't have uh, uh, windows, you can feel claustrophobic. And the way we solve this is to put screens, high definition screens, that allow you to have a complete new way to experience your uh, travel. We use screens that simulate reality because they are above 11K. You know, we look at 120K with our eyes, but in reality, we saw in experiments that we've done that above 11K, the human eye doesn't distinguish the difference between reality and the windows. So we are using techniques to simulate reality. So imagine you are very comfortable inside a capsule. It's similar to an airplane. Uh, the G-force measure acceleration. We are always keeping it below 1G. You're looking outside and you can look at a, let's say, slower version of the reality that is happening outside. But uh, when you move, the camera can record your eyes and actually reposition the image to simulate reality. Now you can travel to Paris or maybe you wanna go somewhere else. You wanna go in Italy, there's good food, you should do it. Or you can travel in the past or in the future, underwater, in space, unleash your imagination. And this is not only a very cool way to travel, we can use it as a new way to monetize users because now the ticket can be used to regulate traffic and you can travel for free. So the safety is also an, another issue. Uh, we developed systems that are way better than the existing technologies. It wasn't that difficult because if you see uh, the flight industry, they have a coefficient of 0.07 every 100 million uh, um, miles of passenger. It means every 3.5 years, an airplane is supposed to go down. We don't think this is an efficient way to travel, right? We can stop the capsule normally in five kilometers, but in an extreme emergency, we can stop it at 6.4 seconds. And you will feel 5G of deceleration, but we will save your life. So, <laughs> it's not very comfortable, but yeah, we do it. So, you have to know something about the normal transportation system. They're all subsidized by the state. Take Los Angeles, and it's one of the best, basically. For every dollar you earn from the ticket, there are $2.5 put from the state of subsidies, and it's all like that. I don't go into high-speed rail because then it will be like a very disaster. But this is the important thing about what we are doing. So how, it's not, it's not. <laughs> how can we live better, a better life? Imagine with the Hyperloop you can go to Paris, to Milan, in, in, instead of uh, taking eight hours in 50 minutes. Good. but. Imagine what it is to have a series of airports that now becomes terminals or ports that can actually move fast uh, goods that we need below four degrees or organs or we can redefine completely the freight industry. Imagine to live somewhere between Los Angeles and San Francisco in a new city that is more uh, um, uh, affordable and you can go 10 minutes to Los Angeles and 10 minutes to San Francisco. Now, we'll talk about the very important thing. When you were a child, we thought that everything was possible, right? So usually when we talk about the Hyperloop, a lot of people think that we are just improving transportation. That's one way to see it. The way I see it is that shrinking distances is basically allowing us to expand human art. And our imagination that was uh, inside um, hibernated 
can be unleashed again with kind of project that can solve problems of humanity. If we are successful, the way we are doing it, we can demonstrate that when humanity comes together, we can solve every problem, energy, food, housing. So there are two magic worlds that we are using. Come closer. And this is expressed in, in a lot of uh, ways when we, we meet our family, we come closer. When we look art, we come closer. When there's a teacher that teaches us something, it's bringing us closer to knowledge. And when you're with friends, right, you come closer. So with the Hyperloop, there's a whisper that we are telling to the world. Come closer, faster. Thank you.